again, if you haven't met him before, to our associate medical director, Dr. Donald Phillips. You heard him talking about life care in Weatherford. He's an ER doc now working in Texarkana, Texas. He's been around a long time, was also, like Dr. Frame, a paramedic uh, in the past as well, and is very highly, highly familiar with the EMS environment. So that having been said, uh, looks like we're going to be talking about gestational diabetes tonight, which is an excellent topic. And if you uh, will keep your microphones muted, unless you have a question or something, you can unmute and ask, or you can type in the chat box and we'll catch it at the end. Uh, but you will have to participate at some point, either during and or as we get close to the end, I'll be making sure you're still here. So that having been said, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn this over to you, Dr. Phillips. Okay. <clears throat> and I've got the little chat window open. So if you come up with questions during, you can go ahead and, and put stuff there. It may not be the right time right then for it, but we'll do what we can. Um, let me get so I don't have all the boxes there. Um, so this is the topic, of course, where everyone kind of cringes because you're going, ooh, pregnant women. And I kind of do the same thing, too. Uh, I tell folks I'm very proud of the fact that the first baby that I delivered was eight or 12 days after I graduated high school in the back of an ambulance as a basic EMT. And then I managed to go until 1991 without delivering another one. So nine years. And then... I delivered 52 in that year, and I'm proud to say that my streak has been uh, has not been broken since 1992. So I don't like delivering babies. It's not one of those things that, that I have ever really cared for, but it's one of those things that we've got to be able to do and we've got to be ready for it. So I found this to actually be a pretty good review for myself as well. So let's see if we can get this. <clears throat> So what defines this? And there, when I got to researching this, there's been quite a few things that have kind of changed a little bit, but really honestly, they jump, they kind of lump all diabetes and pregnancy in as gestational diabetes. But understand that if it's a woman that has not had type one or type two diabetes pre-existing before the pregnancy, then at that point, it's usually going to be towards middle that they're going to pick this up and we'll come up with that in a minute. But the big thing is that it's glucose intolerance that is either recognized during pregnancy or before the pregnancy. And these women, and this is really kind of the important part. And I know that, you know, for us in EMS, we're like, we dropped them off the hospital. It doesn't matter. But these women are more likely for at least three years afterwards to have some clinical risk factors that are related to their diabetes, even if their blood sugar goes back to normal after the delivery. So it doesn't just end there. We got to keep that in mind when we're taking our history and we're asking those questions, what kind of med medical problems do you have? If it's a young woman that has had children, or even if she may have had a stillbirth or something, we still need to ask, did you have gestational diabetes? Look at these numbers here. It doubles the risk of a serious birth injury, triples the chances of them having to have a cesarean section, and four times the risk of a NICU admission. I mean, this is a very devastating problem, and the, the biggest problem that I see is a lot of times it is silent. Until they get a screening test, they don't know that they have it. And, it rep and out of this, I thought it was interesting that if you see 90, and that point, I didn't make it right, 90% of cases of diabetes mellitus in pregnancy are gestational diabetes, but 8% of those were pre-existing type 2 diabetics. And I believe it's about 1% accounts for the type 1 diabetic. So does anybody just real quickly, and, and you can unmute if you want to, can anyone tell me the difference between a type one and a type two diabetic? A very brief, you know, just one sentence answer. I'm born with it or children. I'm sorry, say that again. 
one's uh, type one born with it? Well, not, not necessarily. There's, there's quite a few type one diabetics who will have it either when they're, you know, as a juvenile, as a child, like in their, you know, five, six, eight range as far as age. But there's also a lot of them that will develop this as teenagers. The, the quick and dirty answer is type one diabetics either make inadequate amounts of or they do not make any insulin at all. So most of the time it's thought to be related to a viral pancreatitis that attacks the beta cells there and kills them off so that they don't make enough or they don't make any insulin anymore. Whereas type two diabetics generally are considered to be resistant to insulin. They, they produce plenty of insulin. In fact, they have too much insulin, but they are insensitive to it. So it doesn't work right. So that's really the difference. So first off, the diagnosis of this. This is not something that we are going to be the first ones to diagnose in the field, and it's not our responsibility to. And, but I think that you should understand that this is, a, in most places, is a two-step process. So somewhere after 24 weeks, they're going to go and they're going to be given 50 grams of sugar. And I've heard it described as Coca-Cola syrup. They say it's nasty. Women say that they don't want Coca-Cola after that because it is so thick and it is so strong. It's actually a pretty small amount, but it's horrible. They do not like the taste of the stuff. And so they wait one hour and they check their blood sugar. They check it before, they check it at one hour and they wait to see what happens. So the, if they fail that, so in other words, their blood sugar is over 140 at one hour. Then they're going to have them come back and do this 100 gram, three hour oral glucose tolerance test. And so they also go on to state, and it's the same thing, but they're waiting to see that curve. They'll check it at one hour, two hours, and three hours afterwards, along with beforehand. And they're looking to see what their response is to that glucose load. Okay, in areas that have a lot of insulin resistance, and I wouldn't have thought high pre prevalence would be over 5%, and that's people with type 2 diabetes, they recommend doing just the, the three-hour test. So, you know, they're already suspicious of those folks. And if they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, they don't even bother with this. They just go ahead and treat them. Okay, so... Bobby says hers was orange and it wasn't terrible. Well, that's good. I can't tell you how many women over the years that I've heard tell me how bad this stuff is. Hi, baby. Hi. That's my granddaughter. So. so after they're diagnosed, really the biggest thing is they got to get these women under glycemic control. And the, the longer that they're out of range on their blood sugar, the more damage that's going to be done. And so th the goal of this has to be that these women have to get their, their blood sugar under control. So they eat, it goes up. We want it to go back down below 140 as quickly as possible. So diet, that's, and of course, you know, diet is the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing for me is, you know, Everyone wants to have what they want to eat when they want to eat it. But the, as some of the references call it, the SAD, the standard American diet is loaded with carbohydrates and especially simple carbohydrates in the form of things like Coca-Cola. So we, we need to really stress to these people. And yes, I do believe that it is our job to, to let them know, hey, you know, this is not the best choice for you or you know, once you're done with all this, you know, really it's going to be incredibly important that you follow the diet plan that they, that they give you. So things like that. Medical management may be in the form of oral agents. It may be in the form of insulin. But once again, the goal with all of this is to keep those spikes and those times when they're really high on their blood sugar to as few times as possible. So 
the, they also talk about that there's fetal biophysical tests that have to be done, but those are not things that we're going to do. I didn't put those in this lecture other than to tell you that they're there. But if there's a mother that has gestational diabetes, it's really important that they keep their appointments, that they do what they have to do so that we can be sure that the baby is getting enough oxygen. You're going to see in a, in a bit that a lot of the problems are related to fetal hypoxemia. So the pathophysiology of the whole thing. The mother gets hyperglycemic. It takes a while for that blood sugar to cross over the placenta and get into the fetus, but it does get there. And so the baby is also hyperglycemic. There's two patients that have diabetes involved. Okay, then when they have these recurrent episodes, that just makes it more likely because it, once again, everything, there's a lag. So the mother experiences it, and then a while later, the baby experiences it. And so it's going to take some time and for both of them to get back down into that normal range. <clears throat> the really important part of this is that this causes accelerated growth. And then as it talks about episodic fetal hyperinsulinemia produces excess nu nutrient storage resulting in macrosomia. So let's break that down into a simple sentence, something that's easy to understand. Insulin promotes fat storage. It's as simple as that. In adults, they noticed when these kids that were that had type 1 diabetes were given insulin they all put on weight and the more insulin that they're given the more weight they put on that's also a problem with type 2 diabetics and i had a really good friend unfortunately died not long ago that was type 1 diabetic was very very thin but then as we all get older he didn't follow his diet as well as he should have he was still on insulin trying to keep his blood sugar down, but he kept eating the wrong things, which of course made them give him more insulin, which put on more fat, which caused more problems with his heart and other organs. So it really comes down to insulin. So the, when they have these extra energy expenditures that they have to use in order to store that excess sugar as fat, it also takes away oxygen. You and I, we can just, we take breaths. The baby cannot. The baby is dependent on the oxygen that's coming across that placenta from the mother. So that's why it's even more important that the mom really needs to definitely stay on the diet so that they don't get these episodes of hyperglycemia in the baby. So there's also a surge of catecholamines which can cause high blood pressure in the baby, cardiac remodeling, stimulation, stimulation of erythropoietin. We're going to see that that's a really important thing because it causes hyperplasia and increased hematocrit. The, one of the big problems with these babies is that they can have blood that is so thick because there's red blood cells more than they need that that can cause poor circulation. It can can cause them to infarct organs or even bone. And then later on after they're delivered, it can cause hyperbilirubinemia. So it's all, all of this stuff is so tied together. And the problem is it's hidden. It's, it's behind the skin. You can't see the problems until it's almost, uh, until it is too late in the case of the baby causing those problems or having those problems. So in a normal pregnancy, I thought that this was interesting, normal pregnancy, the mean fasting glucose averages 74 and the peak postprandial, that meaning after they eat. So the peak after they eat rarely exceeds 120. That's what we want to get to. We want these women, and I can't tell you how many times I hear type two diabetics, doesn't matter the age, Oh, my blood sugar is really well controlled. Really? What's your usual blood sugar? About 140. That's not really controlled. That, in fact, 140 used to be the cutoff for diagnosing diabetes. 
If two hours after you ate, if your blood sugar was 140, that is diabetes. So we want this to actually be as close to this mean fasting at 74 and the postprandial 120 as possible. So, and you see why. If it's two hours postprandial below 120, approximately 20% of the babies will have macrosomia. Macrosomia meaning overgrowth, so a large baby. Whereas if it's over 160, it goes up 15%. It's a big number. So in the mother, the problems related to diabetes, and they can get these things as well, diabetic retinopathy, renal disease, and blood pressure problems. Yes, even in a gestational diabetic, they, they are prone to develop diabetic retinopathy. They already have something else growing inside of them that they have hormones that are supporting that growth. It's going to affect them as well. And diabetic retinopathy is a problem related to overgrowth of the blood vessels causing problems. So it's really important that these women follow the diet. And preeclampsia is more prevalent. So preeclampsia is a lecture in and of itself. But as you can see, if their fasting blood sugar is under control where it should be, they only, they're only about 7.8%. It jumps up to 138 if, if their blood sugar is not under control. And then their BMI is also much different. And, and that BMI really seems to be the biggest risk for the preeclamptic woman. So in other words, it's related to the height and the weight. So cardiovascular disease. Tell you what, let's check in real quick and see, does anybody have questions right now? All good so far. Okay, good. All right. So then let's go on to cardiovascular disease. So they do have an increased risk of heart disease postnatally. Okay, so that means that after the baby's born, the mom can still have heart problems that are related to her diabetic time. And I thought that this was interesting. One million women that by 25 years after, after delivering the baby, 190.8 out of 1,000 were hospitalized if they had gestational diabetes. 117.8, almost 20 less if they didn't have, or I'm sorry, almost, almost 60, 70 less, if they didn't have gestational diabetes. So in other words, there's a big risk. That's a huge jump, you know, 82.2% or 82.2 or out of 1,000 more if they had gestational diabetes. And that's 25 years after they had their baby. So and they have an increased risk of ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, cabbage, and, and coronary angioplasty. Obviously, there this is not something that's isolated to even a nine-month period. This is related to the rest of their life, and they need to understand that. And frankly, I don't think that, that our doctors generally do the best of jobs of, of relaying that risk. And if one of my paramedics gets a complaint because he told a pregnant mom that, you know, you've got gestational diabetes and you really need to follow your diet and here's why, I'm going to back them up. I'm going to back them up 100% because they're doing what they should be doing. And we'll get to, to that a little bit later as well. So miscarriage. 9 to 14% rate of miscarriage for all with pre-existing diabetes over non-diabetics. So a 9 to 14% higher risk. Poor glycemic control can make it even worse and poor control over 10 years before pregnancy. So we're talking about women 10 years before they even got pregnant will have a higher miscarriage rate. And, and look at that hemoglobin A1C greater than 11 can increase their risk to around 44%. That means 44% of the time they're going to have some miscarriage with their baby. 
That's that is horrible that we when you think about it, and that is such a controllable thing. So birth defects, major birth defects, only one to two percent. That's actually pretty high. I know that that sounds like a, not a bad number, but it is very high compared to just the general population. And you see there that poor glycemic control, and that's really what it comes down to is poor glycemic control increases the risk for structural abnormalities, four to 8%. Now, most of the major structures in our body as fetuses develop before 12 weeks. We're not even screening these women until they're 24 weeks in most cases. So it just goes to point out that it really is such an important thing and it's important for overall health, even when you're not pregnant. I know I'm not pregnant. I just look like I have been, but it is an important thing for all of us to try to get this stuff under control. So two thirds of those are going to be cardiovascular or central nervous system problems. Neural tube defects, those are, are 13 to 20 times more frequent. And what those are is related to closure of what's called the neural tube. And the neural tube is where your brain and spinal cord develop. So these children are more likely to have what's called anencephaly, which means no brain. The skull and everything is open and exposed when these children are born, or something such as spina bifida, where the bottom of the spinal cord somewhere is open and exposed. These are devastating things. Anencephaly is not survivable. I've had the, the misfortune of delivering one child with anencephaly, and it was the most horrible 10 minutes after the baby was born because the baby was born alive, but there is no hope for the baby, and the baby dies. So, you know, it's one of the reasons that I am somewhat passionate about this is that particular thing right there. Genitourinary, gastrointestinal, and skeletal problems are also more common. Um, I've seen quite a few babies. Once again, that was this was during a one-year period during my internship where I saw all these that had problems such as gastroschisis, which means that their intestines have not come into the body when they were before they they were born. So their intestines are in a sac outside of their body. It's survivable, but it's something that is a devastating thing for them. Then they're also more likely to have problems where perhaps their intestinal contents are up inside of their chest where that doesn't close. And those often are not recognized until the time of birth. So, you know, these are, these are defects that perhaps could have been avoided. Now, I think it's important, and I know it's not sexually um, or related to our sexuality, something that's necessarily fair, but we didn't make the rules on this, but there is no increase in birth defects among the offspring of fathers who have diabetes or the offspring of women who develop gestational diabetes after their first trimester. So in other words, the women who give birth to children who initially their blood sugar was fine, and then after their first trimester, traditionally the first 12 week period, after that they develop gestational diabetes. So those women, they don't tend to have the birth defects. So as it says, preconceptional glycemic control is the main determinant. And as H hemoglobin A1C increases, so does birth defects. Once again, it is incumbent on these women, as soon as they know that they're pregnant, to get in, to get their, their pre, prenatal testing started, and then to, to follow the instructions. Growth restriction. Okay, so fetal morbidity. These are the things that can make the baby sick. That's morbidity. Everyone understand the difference between morbidity and mortality. Morbidity is illness. Mortality is death. So these are the things that are going to make the baby sick or that the things that result from this. Growth restriction. Okay, that one we didn't really hit on very much, but it is a concern that the baby may not grow enough. 
but the biggest problem by far is macrosomia. Okay, and you can see that this is a child that's greater than four kilograms. Four kilograms is 8.8 .8 pounds. So you hear about these children that are nine and 13 pounds, that is macrosomia, okay? 15 to 45% of babies born to diabetic women will have this, and it's a threefold increase over non-diabetic women. And then once again, the maternal obesity has a strong and independent effect so even if the woman doesn't necessarily develop true gestational diabetes, if she is obese herself, there's a high likelihood that her child may have macrosomia. And it's also associated with high rates of neonatal morbidity. So we'll talk about some of those things that, that come along after the fact as well. So the, and I thought this was interesting, their pattern of overgrowth, it's not just everywhere. It's not that they just like, like really big kids. They have sub-Q fat in the abdominal and intrascapular areas and especially the central stuff. So in other words, when you look at these kids, a lot of times they're kind of hunched over a little bit, even when they're laying down because they have this fat deposition between their shoulder blades. And so it's, it's an interesting Thing. when you see these kids that are obvious, it's obvious. And then, um, and I thought that this was interesting. Australian Carbohydrate Intolerance Study demonstrated a positive relationship between the severity of maternal fasting hyperglycemia and the risk of shoulder dystocia. So in other words, as these kids get bigger, there's a higher risk that they're gonna have a difficult time delivering the baby because their shoulders get stuck. And once again, that's a lecture in itself. That's something that you know, is, is a high risk. The baby could die. You could break a bone. There's a lot of, of problems. So you know, it's a little bit beyond this lecture. Metabolic syndrome. So I'm sure that y'all have heard of metabolic syndrome in adults. There's also a, a childhood metabolic syndrome. These are obese children. They have high blood pressure, their blood lipids are out of whack, and they have glucose intolerance. We have all probably seen these kids and just thought they're just overweight kids. But there, there may be more to it, and it's more likely in these children that are born to a gestational diabetic mother. And you can see the 10 by age 10 to 16, okay, that they have impaired glucose tolerance. And those fetuses that are born large appear, appear to be at the greatest risk. So once again, we come back to the macrosomia being a greater risk. So the, the other thing that I would emphasize, and I've said it, I don't know how many times, but in these women, it's really prudent that we should tell them you're going to be preventing a lot of problems for you and your baby if you maintain glycemic control. You've got to keep that that blood sugar under control. There's obviously cardiovascular risk factors. We talked about that, you know, there can be um, higher catecholamines and things like that. And hypertension is listed right up above there. There can also be a higher risk of ADHD in these kids and then other compromised neurobehavioral function. So those are all sort of some problems that are related to this that are not gonna be evident for years. So, once again, the, the perinatal mortality risk are twice those in the non-diabetic population. Congenital malformations, respiratory distress syndrome, these are what kill most of these children. Injuries at birth, and we talked about the shoulder dystocia, you may have seen some of the, you know, if your child has ads, one of them is brachial plexus trauma, or, and they, that's related to shoulder dystocia, because sometimes you have to literally pull the kid out by an arm, and that can stretch the big nerve bundle in the neck known as the brachial plexus. And those are so often permanent injuries to these children. But the good news is you go down there to the next point, strict glycemic control, and it's only slightly higher than the non-diabetic women. 
3.2 versus 2.5%. So once again, it is really important, even when we see these mothers early on during their pregnancy, if we notice that their blood sugar is 180 or 200, and they didn't say that they just ate, if they're pregnant, we should, I think, in my opinion, as a medical director, I want my guys to say, you know, listen, you really need to follow your diet. You're eating for two right now, and the baby doesn't need that. And here's some of the reasons, you know, you're, you're risking causing problems for the rest of this child's life because of metabolic syndrome and things like that. I think that that's a reasonable thing for us as healthcare providers to give to give that information to our patients. Polycythemia, hey, we talked, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, just wanted to, I just finished the uh, pregnancy OBGYN lessons and um, it went over a number of different birthing and complications um, in the field. Can you speak a little bit to that with this, in relation to this? Are we gonna see differences? Yeah, when we see differences in like non-normal presentations, um, you know, there's been some like uh, breech births and frank breaches and that kind of thing. Yeah, we'll we'll touch on that very briefly because you know, frankly, the, what I the references that I was looking at didn't get into that very much. Um, you know, they're like we talked about the shoulder dystocias are much more likely to happen in in these kids because of their size. Certainly, you can have more possibility of a front or of a um, breech delivery because of the fact that these kids don't turn like they should within the within the uterus. We talked about growth restrictions. That can sometimes be one of those growth restrictions that they basically get stuck down there. And once again, these women have a higher risk of having to have a C-section, and it's primarily because of those sort of risk that they end up having to go for those. As far as, you know, things like, I don't believe that there is an increased risk of like a uh, footling presentation or, um, you know, arm presentation, things like that. Primarily in these babies, the risk is more related to the size of the child and having difficulties because of that. Um, and if they're going to get stuck somewhere, it's most likely, and at least from what I read, it's going to be that it's either a breach or it's going to be the shoulders primarily. Then again, that's why I am not an OBGYN. <laughs> I don't want, I, I have enough stuff that makes my, makes my butt need to pucker on some cotton. I don't need something else that on a daily basis did that to me. Every, I tell you, every delivery that I did that year in my internship, it was one of those, oh my God, I hope everything goes well. Um, just simply because of, of it's two people and one of them is totally innocent, has never done a thing wrong a day in their life because they haven't had a day in their life yet. Thank you. Okay. So, we talked about the the having the overproduction of red blood cells. That's what polycythemia is. And as a result of that, though, they may not have enough oxygen in the blood. I know that sounds like it would hold on to it, but you only have four spots on each each hemoglobin molecule to hold on to oxygen. And at some point you get too many of those places, too many of the little Dixie cups running around to hold oxygen, there's not enough oxygen to go into them. And then that causes ischemia or infarctions or sludging. And so you, these kids can have strokes, prenatal strokes as a result of this. So you know, very bad things. Hypoglycemia, I know that that sounds they're hyperglycemic. They're floating around in this blood that is hyperglycemic, but their pancreas is secreting insulin as well. And so then, especially after delivery, they are more prone to have these periods where all of a sudden these children may have seizures and may go into a coma, and they may be simply because of their blood sugar being too low. One of the things, and it's in the lecture again later on, in pediatrics, one of the professors one day, if she said it once, she said it at least 20 times in an hour lecture about the, the perinatal period, keep them warm, keep them sweet. So 
anytime that there's a problem, be sure that they're not too cold and check their blood sugar. You can't check it too many times. If you think that there's a problem with their with the with the baby after birth, check the blood sugar should be one of the first things you do. Neonatal hypocalcemia. So their their calcium may suddenly drop too low. I did not look up the pathophysiology for this. I apologize. I don't have a nice graph for that, but just understand that hypocalcemia can can rear its head is with this as well. And we'll cover a little bit about what you're looking for for that in a second. Hyperbilirubinemia. Now, this is not something that we're going to see. It's going to occur later on because as the baby slowly adjusts to the, the postnatal period, they will start to have those extra red blood cells that they have been producing because of mom's hyperglycemia. That will start to go back down to normal. Those red blood cells don't just magically disappear. They, have, they end up dying off. Your liver has to metabolize them and break them down, and that increases the bilirubin. And bilirubin alone can cause brain damage and other CNS problems. So, you know, it's, it's not just that all of a sudden they're losing this, that blood that they didn't need. It can cause other problems. The, the fetal lungs mature maturity occurs later in pregnancies with poor maternal glycemic control. It doesn't matter if it's gestational diabetes, type one or type two. The, the lungs in these children tend to mature later. That means that even if they're at 36 weeks, they may not have the, the fetal lung development of even a 30 week child. So anytime that you have happen to deliver one of these, just be aware that they may have lung problems. You're going to have to watch these kids closely. Hey, Doc. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no. Uh, the previous slide, you had talked about polycythemia. And um, is this something that happens um, in utero as the baby's developing? They develop all these red, extra red blood cells? Or is this something that happens kind of on delivery? And no, how long no. Go ahead. No, I was thinking, I mean, when the kidneys start to spill this hypoxia and, and you know, uh, producing this visceral proetin, um, how long does that normally take? Is that, is that like days or is that like minutes or is that like weeks? That, that is actually over, well, first off, as far as erythropoietin's action itself, that takes hours or uh, days. For that to do anything. As far as the fetal or the polycythemia that we're talking about, this is something that has occurred usually over weeks to maybe even months or more. So it's not something that just started suddenly. This is something that has been there. The polycythemia once again occurs because the baby has fetal hypoxia because of the catecholamines and the, the poor circulation and the blood sugar going up and all these other issues that occur. And it's a cumulative process. So it's, it's cumulative and it's insidious and it's not going to show up really until the baby is delivered because we, while it can show up before that, we don't have a way of testing that. If you go back to that was the biophysical testing on the fetus, all of those tests that they are doing on that fetus are there to look for hypoxia in the baby. So, but uh, nobody's gonna go and draw a CBC on a, on, a, on a baby that's a fetus still. It's not gonna happen. So during a field birth, uh, what would we like to see if we kind of when we either told this or we suspect this, and then we've got uh, you know maybe we're we gonna see a limb that has some um, some ischemia or something. Generally, if you're going to see a problem related to this, it's going to be related to you know a, an arm that isn't working. You know the, where the child may have had a, a prenatal stroke or something like that. Um, these are things that generally we're not going to see a lot of. You may see er that the child has poor oxygenation because once again, if you only have, you know, so many little Dixie cups to fill up, 
you know, then a lot of times it's easy to fill those up. But if you have a whole bunch of them, then you may not have as much. And our pulse oximetry is all that it's doing is it's giving you a percentage of all of those places that can hold oxygen, how many of them have oxygen on them. And so when all of a sudden you switch over from this baby that was getting all of the oxygenation through the placenta, and now the baby is having to oxygenate through the lungs, and the and fetal hemoglobin does not carry oxygen as well as regular hemoglobin. There is a difference between the blood that they make before they're born and the blood that they make up to and after they're born. So that fetal hemoglobin does not hold on to oxygen as strongly as adult hemoglobin. And it does that because it wants to be able to dump the oxygen to the tissues. So because of that though, when the baby's born, they may not oxygenate as well. Then throw in that they may not have as mature of lungs when they are born, even at term. Now they're not getting as much oxygen delivery into a system that doesn't hold on to the oxygen as well as, as we expect. So it's, it's a cumulative sort of problem. So in the field, you know, at the rival or uh, by family or whatnot, um, or we see this or suspect this um, presentation of the baby or expulsion of the baby, um, is the correct response like IV fluids for this, or is this like just passes on to the ED and they hand off the baby? Well, first off, you're you're not going to be able to get an IV on these babies unless you have the ability to to cannulate their umbilical vein. It, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, in these cases, th the treatment is oxygen and more oxygen because you want to get as many of those little Dixie cups filled with oxygen, taking it to the tissues that you can. So you're not going to do anything for polycythemia. It's the treatment for that, not in a baby, but if you or I had polycythemia, the treatment is that we go to the blood center and we have a therapeutic donation. That blood is discarded, by the way. But you go and you, you're, it's basically bloodletting. Don't do that to a baby, okay? But just keep in mind that the, the treatment for this is not something that we're going to be able to do other than applying oxygen and diesel. Okay, got it. I have a question too. Um, Absolutely. For the polycythemia, are we talking about pretty much immediately after birth, or is this something that continues for weeks, or how about how long is the period for this? It will take several days for the baby's blood circulation to change from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin. Say adult, that's not really the right terminology, but um, but to switch over to regular hemoglobin like you and I have. That takes several days for that to occur. So it doesn't take a long time, but once again, these are, these are children that are already prone to having a lot of other problems. And so it's just one more checkbox on the list of problems that they can have. And yeah, it, it's not something that, that comes on quickly or goes away quickly. So then it's not something we would see um, after a newborn has been released from the hospital a month or two out and no. then potential for thromb thrombolytic therapy or anything similar to a stroke? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, and, and actually a lot of times when these babies have those strokes, it ends up that it's a hemorrhagic event anyway. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good questions. I appreciate good questions. There was a, I recently, well, before the COVID stuff, I went to a lecture on CROFAB to a conference there and, and a PhD biochemist stood up and he, before he started talking, he said, okay, now I'm going to tell you right now, I want you to interrupt me and I want you to give me questions because when you ask me questions, I learn. And you know what? That's a great attitude. I, I, I hope that I always have that same attitude with you guys. I love your questions and they're a learning experience for, for me as well. And it should be for any of us. So please always ask questions. There's not a dumb question. 
So now we'll move on. Here's the disclaimer, okay? If you look up gestational diabetes, pre-hospital approach or EMS approach or anything like that, you're going to find very little other than, yeah, these women may have big babies. That's pretty much the extent of it. I want you guys to think critically about these things. And you're asking, I honestly do mean that you're asking some really good questions. And frankly, a couple of them have been a little bit on the difficult side for me. So, yeah, I appreciate that. And that's good. That's what we need because once again, that's going to spur me to learn as well. So going forward in this lecture, a lot of this stuff is not something that you're going to find written anywhere. You're not going to be able to look up a reference for it. Okay, so first off, how do we approach this? To me, the biggest thing is this is one of the places where community paramedicine should really, really shine. This is where we get to be people that try to prevent people using our service. I know that that sounds strange, but we have the ability to do hemoglobin A1C screenings. We can draw that blood, we can take it to the lab. We can do that with these people, even if their primary care provider, who is not an OBGYN, calls up and says, hey, listen, Life Care, I would like for you to please visit my patient so-and-so. She's pregnant, and I think that she may have diabetes. Can you go and do some stuff for me? And then, you know, I've already got her set up in three weeks to go to the OBGYN. Well, we're cutting time off of there because that way she's not going to have to go to the OBGYN get the lab test drawn, go back, and then find out what to do. So we can help with speeding that up. We can give them some education from the start. There's no reason that some of this information in this lecture should not be in a handout for EMS to be able to give out to these folks and go, this is why it is so important. You're 20 years old and you have type two diabetes and your blood sugar is, is 200 and you haven't eaten in three hours. This is why it's important for you to get this under control things such as that. And if we have a time, we should be able to, to be able to say, okay, you know, who does OBGYN that's high risk around our area so that we can try to get them in with those people quicker than they would otherwise. Okay. So I really think that this is one of those areas where as, as community paramedicine becomes more and more prevalent, that we should be able to use this as, as one of the things that we say, we need funding, okay? And we should be able to, hopefully in the future with some of the changes, be able to actually bill for this. So standard EMS. So once again, we may be the reason that somebody actually gets into the high-risk OB people because we say, hey, you know, she hadn't eaten in like six hours and her blood sugar is 180. You know, she could have gestational diabetes. You know, can you help with trying to get it into those things? And, you know, I'll be honest with you, my colleagues and I, we don't always do the best with that. Sometimes it may be a paramedic coming up and saying, you know, maybe you should refer her to a high-risk OBGYN rather than waiting. You know, Frankly, I hate to say it this way, but sometimes when you come and tell me something that you're concerned about, I actually do pay attention to it and I do more than I would otherwise. So the other big thing is you got to recognize that these are high risk cases when you deliver the baby. So once again, recognizing the risk, are they previously diagnosed? Once again, morbid obesity. So if you see this woman that is pregnant and she is obviously morbidly obese, she's got a higher risk. And then any time a, pre a pregnant woman has diabetes, they're higher risk. And things to anticipate. With these gestational diabetic moms, you got to worry about preterm labor, macrosomia, big baby, shoulder dystocias, you're going to have to pull them out, birth defects, some of them devastating, respiratory issues. Hypoglycemia, once again, keep them warm, keep them sweet. It's not just for babies, it works for, for the elderly in nursing homes as well. You gotta keep them warm, you gotta keep them sweet. Stillbirth, this is one of the really, really hard parts of this, is delivering a baby that's dead, okay? And it happens. 
hypocalcemia. So once again, poor tone, weak cry, may have tetany or seizures. So they may be sitting here just, that's tetany, okay? So summarizing. So process that takes place over a long period of time and often not even just during the nine months. And there, currently we have a limited role, but we have, in my opinion, a responsibility to educate people no matter what. And so this should be one of those things that we could and should educate our populations. And you can see here, you don't need me necessarily read the slide to you, but if they're pre-existing diabetics, if they're morbidly obese, if they are GDM, you got to get these folks to doing what they need to do to take care of themselves and their baby. And sometimes that begins before they're even pregnant. And then be prepared for complications. Communicate with the hospital. Anytime that you have a diabetic mom, just please be sure and let us know so that we can, if we need to, get the proper people in place. So before we go to the next two slides, or the next couple of slides, which are some sample questions, do y'all have any other questions right now? Dr. Phillips, we're going over. Yeah, go ahead, Murphy. One other complication um, of birth for a diabetic from a personal experience is poly polyhydramnios. Um, during my wife's pregnancy, she was approximately four times the amount of amniotic fluid that was supposed to be present. Yeah. And, and that has a whole list of other complications in itself. And so, and I never saw anything that said that that was necessarily a risk of uh, gestational diabetes. I know it's a risk in general, but did they say that that was associated? I'm just kind of curious. Yes, sir, they did. And huh. part of the reason that it was a problem was my daughter had the equivalent of an Olympic sized swimming pool to float around in and they were worried about yeah. cord entanglements and everything else. Exactly. Um, I was told that at the end of the presentation, um, I have some personal stories I can certainly share on this subject from okay. my wife and my daughter. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, getting a knot in the cord is frankly one of my biggest fears because I've seen it just way too many times or having them have it around their neck. So anything else? Okay. Uh, one second, sorry. Um, sure. I guess for the hypoglycemic uh, patient, is this where we would be administering maybe the D10 or D25 at this time? Yes. Yeah. In, in a baby, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and especially when we had all the shortages of D50, I switched everything over to D10. It makes it easy. You don't have to worry about it extravasating in anyone. And guess what? The dose is the same in everyone, one cc per kilo. So, you know, it, it's an easy thing for us to use. Um, but, you know, it, this is one of the places now, actually, uh, one hospital that I worked at, I didn't deliver the baby. It was delivered the, on the night shift before I got there they actually didn't stock D25. So that's way too strong for a newborn. So you gotta, you gotta be sure the, the same sort of thing that I see Wayne says that they switched over to D10 as well. So, what? No. So, um, yeah, so, and frankly, I, I love D10. Um, the adults that I've given it to, they say when they wake up, they don't feel like they're drunk like they used to. They don't have these huge fluid shifts. So, you know, I just think it's a little bit nicer. My crews don't necessarily care for it because on so many of the diabetics before you give them the D50 and they're like, I'm not riding in the ambulance anywhere. All right, sign here, sir. Yeah, so we get fewer of those because it takes longer to get them their dose. Excellent question. Thank you. We don't have anything in our protocols for it, but is there any uh, dosage difference if someone were to say they were having twins or triplets or you know, well, expanding it over a longer time? Well, you're talking about giving it to the, to the baby itself. Okay. That, that's what we're worried about is the baby becoming hypoglycemic. You know, 
for the mom, if the mom's hypoglycemic, the dose is still one cc per kilo for her. Okay. And if you think about it, we give them that 50 gram load as the D50. That's an awful lot of, of glucose. I mean, it's not uncommon to have them have a blood sugar that went from 40 to 360. Anything else? Once again, excellent questions. I, and I, I do mean it. I do want you to ask questions. Okay. So sample question. And this first one's a little bit different. It's not really a national registry style question, but so called at 3 a.m. pregnancy complication, 23-year-old female, 31 weeks into her pregnancy based on her dates. She's only had one home pregnancy test and she is G3P2. She's not been to any prenatal care at all. And she's got lower abdominal cramping and pressure in her vagina. And she denies discharge or bleeding. Just right there, you can respond either in chat or if you want to just real quick unmute what what are you thinking about first preterm labor yeah preterm labor that's got to be the first thing that you think about her vital signs heart rates 110 respirations 22 blood pressure 118 over 60 pulse ox is 98 percent and you estimate because she hasn't ever weighed herself that she weighs about 110 kilos and her glucose is 186 so physical exam, really not a bunch. I mean, she's obese. She seems to maybe have a uterus that you can palpate, but she then again, for the obesity, you can't really tell. And there's no vaginal discharge or bleeding. You actually do a sterile bimanual examination and you don't feel anything. The cervix is not open. So, Everyone can unmute if you want to. Tell me a little bit about what's your plan. What What do you want to do with this patient? I have a question first before we get to that. The sterile vaginal exam, sure. is that something we do? We, you we have sterile gloves? Field? Do you have sterile, um, sterile in, gloves? In the OB kit. None besides that? Okay, so. if, you, if you're getting to the point where you're thinking that you're going to have to look and maybe deliver a baby, you probably need to have sterile vaginal exams. Don't stick unsterile gloves up into the, into the vagina. Um, in this case, you happen to have them. So you, you just, and what we're talking about, if you, if you go and do some time at a labor and delivery, is you put on sterile gloves and you put some lube on and you go up inside and you're looking to see, okay, can you feel where the baby is? How far out? So, you know, if the introitus is here, you know, are you feeling the baby here, here, or here? And then how wide is the cervix dilated? And you get to where you're like, you know, fingers and then comparing to a ruler to tell how wide the cervix is open. In this case, you don't even feel the uterus. And of course, uh, the ultimate is you, you open and you look and you see hair staring at you. With, without a sterile glove. So that That's is not one of our, okay. I know one it's not question. one of, yeah. And it's not a test question, okay? Well, Once again, sorry. this is one of those things where, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to build thought processes. So, and, and you'll see that on the next slide, especially. All right, so. so so I think, in my opinion, a reasonable plan for this patient is going to be that we're going to initiate that uh, um, IV, give her some fluids, just KVO, probably even with that heart rate of 110, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go ahead and, and run a liter bolus in. It's also going to help with her blood sugar some and just transport. So... We talked about all sorts of problems here. Any particular problems that you want to think about that, yeah, and actually Wayne asked a great question. Last menstrual period and is she sure? 
No, she's not. She's only had one pregnancy test. And, you know, I was, she says that she thinks she's 31 weeks pregnant. We don't really know. Once again, that's why you at least need to open up the legs and take a look, if nothing else, and make sure that there's not hair staring at you. God forbid there's something like this staring at you. So potential problems. Once again, you may have mom that is actually in labor. You may notice that there's a bunch of fluid. There may be bleeding, things like that. Additionally, with this mom, you want to be sure that you're giving her some fluids because of her heart rate being high. That's not really that high in a pregnant woman, but that she's assumed at 23 that she's got good kidneys and she's going to be able to get that, that fluid out. She shouldn't be fluid overloaded. So let's move on to the next slide and you'll, I, I think you'll understand a little bit more about why I'm asking some of these things. Now this is, it says a new concept. This is a new concept for you guys. It is not a new concept for my field people. And it's certainly not a new concept for emergency medicine because it's been being taught now well over 10 years now. And I stole it. I didn't come up with this. I stole it from the Duke University emergency medicine residency because I was in a, a class about emergency medicine teaching. And this was one of the things that, that I took out of this. So we asked to ask residents and medical students, can you list four potential problems? You can't repeat any of them. So we have the spit. So the first one is a serious problem. I don't care what it is. Give me a serious problem. There's no right or wrong answer. We're just wanting you to think about all of the possible problems. What is a probable problem? The way that I put this is, this is what you really think is going on, okay? An interesting problem. You may have heard, we have, we have a, a, a saying in medicine, if you're out on the plains of West Texas and you hear hoofbeats over the horizon, think about horses, not zebras, because you're more likely to see horses. But you still have to think about the zebra because otherwise you're gonna wonder, what was that black and white striped horse that ran past me? So that's where the interesting comes in. This can be as off the wall as you want, okay? And then a treatable thing, okay? Treatable in this case could simply be that she may become hypoglycemic and I need to treat that. So these are the things that, that I want people to think about. The next one is can you answer four more questions? The skid part. So we talk about a spit and a skid. So spit is differential diagnosis or potential problems. Skid is, a, is way more involved, but it's a simple way to remember these things. First off, are they sick or not sick? Now, I'm sure that Jane can, will attest to the fact that when we got out of paramedic school, we all had a partner at some point that was like, oh my God, we got to do something. We're like, what are you talking about? This patient is about to crash. How the hell do you know that? And then it happens. Okay, what we want is we want you to start looking at these people and start to say, okay, you know, this one is sick, this one is not sick, okay? The, and I actually taught an hour lecture at the, at the state conference one year on sick or not sick. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons actually has a textbook and a course that you can take on sick or not sick. And our whole goal is to get you to where you are recognizing things that somebody with five years experience recognizes, not because they learned how to look for it, but because they have seen enough patients that they have that clinical instinct. And it is a skill that can be taught. We're not necessarily teaching it here, but it is something that you can learn. And the biggest thing is making the decision when you see the patient the first time, are they sick or not sick? And then go from there. And with the residents and the medical students, I want them to declare sick or not sick. You can be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. What are the killer things? What are the things that if you don't think about it and make sure it's not there, could kill that patient? All of them. 
interventions. What do you want to do? Okay, especially with the, with the residents and the medical students, we want them to declare, okay, well, I want to start an IV, put them on a monitor, I want to give them a fluid bolus, and we're going to draw these labs. That's what I want is, and for you guys, it may be as simple as, I'm going to put them on a monitor, I want to start an IV, I want to give them a fluid bolus, and then by God, we got to apply some heavy duty diesel to get them to the hospital. Okay, but thinking about your plan, and then disposition. Now, with disposition in the ER, we think about admit or not admit, okay? For pre-hospital though, this disposition is probably even more important because we're thinking, do they need a specialty center? Do they need to go to a place that has, in this case, a uh, high level NICU? Do they need to go someplace that just has a doctor that can deliver this baby? You know, some parts of the country, you don't have OB at every hospital. Do we need to be sure that we're taking them to a hospital that has that level of care? In the case of a, of a stroke, do they need a stroke center, chest pain? Do they need to go to a chest pain center or a place with a cath lab, or are they okay going to the community hospital? So they're, for pre-hospital, that D, that disposition, is actually a pretty involved step, okay? I would encourage you, if you don't have this copied down, come back and watch the video and find this slide and then look and see, okay, take these things down and start to think about them every time you see a patient. I do it still to this day. So last question. This one is more board or national registry style. 30-year-old G2P1 who is 39 weeks, and she is diagnosed at 28 weeks with gestational diabetes, and she has not been following her advice and has not been taking her medicine. And she has labor and broke her, out, her waters about an hour ago. These are her vitals, not too far different than the last one. And on her physical exam, she's crowning. She has IVO2 monitoring performed. And after 15 minutes, you deliver a baby, male child, that appears large for gestational age. And these are the baby's vitals. And you have a one minute APGAR of seven and a five minute APGAR of four. So just based on that right there, anybody wanna unmute and say sick or not sick? Sick. Yeah, very sick. This baby is, is going down the tubes quick. So what is your most appropriate action? Don't answer until everything is up there. Okay. So dextrose, oxygen, intubate, stimulate manually, or suction the airway. So who answered A? Again, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to, to tell me off the top of your head. It does not matter. We need to, but I, I wanna, wanna find out. Anybody think A? Okay. So A is, is not probably your best choice without having a dextrose already drawn. Okay. And once again, if you remember what APGAR stands for, appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respirations. So you know, if, you, if you look, the baby is getting more and more floppy. And so they're not grimacing as much and their activity's down, okay? So B, anybody want B? I'll tell you that B is not necessarily a bad choice, but it's not the most appropriate action at this point. How about C? Okay. How about stimulate manually, D? Yeah, I can go for that. I think that that's a reasonable step. How about suction the airway? So you're assuming that there's uh, there's no indication of secretions or anything, but uh, if there was, then of course. 
Yeah, and you know, frankly, I don't think that anybody or I would not be upset if you said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and let's just be sure that there's not been some meconium or something. I'm going to go ahead and get the airway stuff out, take a look at the airway, and make sure that I don't need to suction it. Suctioning with just a bulb syringe, that's I think that's fine too. That actually is going to kind of accomplish the same thing as D. It's going to stimulate the child. Frankly, I think probably your best answer in this case is going to be to go ahead and, and intubate the child. And although it's not on there, go ahead and get a blood sugar. Okay, because chances are this is a hypoglycemic kid. So, you know, that's your most likely thing. Um, so once again, keep them warm, keep them sweet. So, you know, I, I don't like it the way, the way that I wrote the question. I wrote the question, okay? The way that I wrote the question, there's not one right answer. There's several right answers. And that's where, you know, it's one of those you need to, you need to be sure and say, okay, what are all the things that I'm going to check? If you check the blood sugar on this kid, the kid probably is going to be hypoglycemic. But airway, airway, airway. So any other questions? Do you think if you had to right now, if we said, give me the differential stuff, Good question there, Wayne. You can get a blood sugar off of the cord blood. Um, I would prefer that you do a heel stick because you're commingling mom's blood with the baby's. So you're not sure really whose blood sugar you're getting. But it's a good question. So a heel stick is going to be fine. You know, you can use your regular lancet and, and do that. So, you know, for me, a spit and skid on this kid, serious, I would say hypocalcemia or respiratory failure. Um, probable hypoglycemia, interesting uh, stroke, intrauterine stroke. Treatable, once again, you could either you could go with the airway stuff. There's several options there. Skid, this kid is definitely sick, okay? So sick or not sick, um, killer diagnoses, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, and airway. Those are, those are the big three in this kid. And then disposition, this kid needs to go to a place that has a high level neonatal care if possible. So, and if you can't get them to that place, let's say that you are out where I used to work in Graham, Texas. It's 90 miles to Fort Worth, 60 miles to Wichita Falls and 90 miles to Abilene. So at that point, it's reasonable to say, okay, we're bringing this kid in. You might wanna go ahead and call for transport to take this kid to a high level NICU. And here's what I got. You know, once again, you're doing that disposition part. And to me, that is an important thing that you are thinking ahead. You know, where you may be able to take them may not be the best place to, to be, but it's going to be the best place to get them stabilized until they can get to that place. So any questions? I know there's got to be questions. I've got questions. You answered all my questions. How about you, Amy? We haven't heard anything from you. Uh, Curtis Monroe, we haven't heard anything from you. I have a question, but it's way back from something from the beginning. Um, you That's talked fine. about doing the testing at 24 weeks, but then we spent, you know, a lot of time talking about all of the lifetime complications that the kids can have. So what's the purpose of waiting for 24 weeks for the screening testing for the moms for gestational diabetes? Is that like a certain... That's as, well, first off, that's actually an excellent question, and I should have actually kind of touched on that. First off, understand that most of these women, when they first go in to see an OBGYN with their pregnancy, a lot of times they're already at somewhere between 8 and 12 weeks. Many times they're already past 12 weeks. 
and they are going to get a battery of screening labs then. And so if they already have a hemoglobin A1C that's elevated, or if their blood sugar is elevated, it's going to get picked up before, before that 24 weeks. Then a lot of times, probably the biggest reason is it's been traditional that it's at 24 weeks. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that before 20 weeks, the baby is considered non-viable. And so, you know, we, we want to wait until they're beyond that age of viability so that, okay, now we can get intense on actually doing some stuff, trying to get this under control. That would be my guess. I'll be honest with you. I don't really know the honest answer to that. The references that I looked at all just said that the screening tests were done at after that date. And so there's, but once again, all of these women, when they enter prenatal care, they have routine labs that are drawn and certainly chemistries and a blood sugar, renal function, H&H, uh, &H, all of those are things that are going to be done anyway. And so they're going to recognize those things at that point. But it is, a, it really is a good question. Hmm? You're welcome. What else? Curtis says he has no questions. Should we ask him a question? I think we should ask him a question because he's been very, very <laughs> quiet. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> okay. Very good. So I take one, one, one last question real quick. Okay. Um, is there anything from a doctor's standpoint that you see um, widespread that happens on a normal basis from paramedics that bring in either a newborn or a mother who's about to deliver? Is there something in general that's kind of a pet peeve of yours or that you would like to see more or less of on a widespread scale? Well, pet peeve for any ER doctor would be that you stop in the ER with this patient. Go to labor and delivery. We don't want them. <laughs> No, I, I honestly, I, I can't say that there's really anything in particular. Um, yeah, I, I've worked with a variety of services over the years. I've lost count of how many, I'm sure, just simply because especially the time at JTS, we saw so many different ones. And I can't tell you that, that I ever had any problems with anybody bringing you know, a, a pregnant woman in. And once again, yeah, part of that is the fact that almost every place that I've been, we have labor and delivery. And so we don't usually even see those people. Um, so, you know, as far as if I had to say that there was a problem and I don't even know where I would go because, you know, it's especially for me, I'm probably the wrong one to ask because I tend to err on the side of you guys doing you know, the best that you can with a bad situation, no matter what. Um, I have never, I've been an EMS medical director now since 2001. I have never had anybody complain about the care of a pregnant woman that I can recall. So. Thank you. You know, the big, big thing is those ABCs just got to do those ABCs and keep up with them and then keep in mind, once again, keep them warm and keep them sweet. The way that I describe that in layman's terms, because that's, that sounds kind of flippant, is, okay, grandma's blood sugar is 286. You need to get this under control, but just keep in mind that if you're going to kill someone with diabetes, Killing them by making their blood sugar go real high is a very inefficient way to do it. It takes years, decades to kill them that way. But if you drop their blood sugar low, that takes minutes. That is an official way to kill someone with diabetes is to let them become hypoglycemic. So please don't let them do that. So if you think about it from that perspective, hypothermia and hypoglycemia in these kids kills them quickly. It kills adults quickly. So, but, you know, having that pediatrician say that probably a hundred times in an hour, I still remember that. Keep them warm, keep them sweet. So, Curtis, 
Give me your spit and skid for this lady. Curtis, are you there? For the lady or for the, the um, newborn? For this patient on the screen. This is, this is the first patient that we gave a thing for. Well, she doesn't so, look uh, terribly sick. Okay. She has cramping and, and, and she denied discharge and bleeding, but uh, her vitals don't look you know, crazy and she's already, you know, the only thing that's un uh, remarkable is her glucose. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the spit and skid. So the S is for serious. So first things for for problems. So a serious problem. No, I don't. I don't nothing's super serious. Well, how about preterm labor? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that could be a serious thing. Okay, probable. What do you think she probably has? Preterm labor. No, you can't can't repeat. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's why you can't say preterm labor, preterm labor, preterm labor, and preterm labor. No, it has to be four items. See, I want you thinking broader. So how about false labor? That's really probably what she has. Okay. All right. Okay. How about for an interesting problem? Braxton Hicks, I like that. That's a, that's a good probable thing. Anything else? So for an interesting thing, um, how about um, urinary tract infection? I mean, it happens commonly, but presenting this way, that would be uncommon. How about a treatable problem? A treatable problem would be a normal delivery, right? Or no? Yeah, that's definitely treatable. That's treatment. So is she sick or not sick? Anybody I'd go with not sick. In? Not yeah. sick. Yeah, me too. Okay, so what are the killer things that if she, if we don't recognize it, it could cause her problems? What could kill her? Like ectopic. Mm -hmm. You know, an ectopic at 31 weeks, she's she's already died from that if she had an ectopic at 31 weeks. Like a uterine rupture or something? Uterine rupture, absolutely. That would be a killer sort of thing. We're not going to be able to diagnose that, but you got to kind of think about it. How about a PE? I know that that's not related necessarily to her complaint, but PEs are more likely in pregnant women. They are in a hypercoagulable state. So anytime that they're having something, I still think about could it be a PE? Anything else? My wife is sitting just behind my computer and listening to this because I took you guys off <laughs> the speakers and she's uh, 29 weeks pregnant. This is a fun conversation. No, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> How about um, torch infections? So I know that that's not something that you guys think about, or nor should you, but these are the things that can be passed on to a baby at the time of delivery. So their toxoplasmosis, uh, oh shoot, I'm thinking of the, oh, I can't remember that one. Rubella, um, chlamydia, herpes, those are things that can be passed on to the baby at the time of infection and potentially cause problems downstream. So, so the, those are some of the things that I would think about with the killer diagnosis. So interventions, 
what do you want to do with this lady? I think we kind of touched on that. Give her IV fluids and apply diesel. Yeah. Yeah, I like the left lateral recumbent position. So, so Michael, why, why do you want to do left lateral recumbent? Other than to what the text help prevent, says. Just to help prevent supine hypotensive syndrome and also with abdominal cramping and pressure, it doesn't say anything about nausea, but she could start to develop nausea, which would lead to vomiting and there's a potential for aspiration. So having her in that left lateral recumbent would also help with the discharge and to prevent that. Yeah. So why do we put her also, in the lateral? You can also elevate her like 30 degrees so uh, the baby's not pressing on the superior vena cava. Yeah. And, and that's the answer I was looking for to why do we want her in the left lateral recumbent position, why not the right, is you want to keep her off of that inferior vena cava. Okay. And then, so disposition. I think this lady needs a specialty center or, and I don't know where you work, you may be in a place that don't, you only have one hospital as an option, and I get that. But does anyone think that she needs any specialty care that's not necessarily, you know, community hospital? I know as the ER doctor, I want you to bring her to the hospital that has labor and delivery rather than to me. Yeah, I like to keep calm too. <laughs> I like the way that that comes out worded to everyone, keep calm. And so Mike, we need you to go and visit Curtis since they don't have any mics at their station. We'll play on words there. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? Um, uh, back to the uh, sample question number two, um, I guess yeah. if the APGAR that we obtained was four, and I know you said that there were, you know, maybe multiple answers that could be okay, uh, would it be okay to do the blow by oxygen first to see if uh, the baby's, you know, sats came by up, and, or would you jump straight to the intubation? No, I, first off, you got to pre-oxygenate, right? Right. So while you're getting everything together, you know, there's no reason why the your partner can't hold some blow by on this baby. And in fact, they should, preferably in the form of a pediatric BVM that they're holding over and blowing by that way, not bagging, but, you know, at least blowing in their face. <laughs> I agree, Curtis. Anything else? Dr. Phillips, I'm happy to talk about what happened with my daughter, if you don't sure. mind. Sure. So, Abby, would you come over here for a minute, please? Yes, come over here and see Daddy. Then she's happened to be sitting in the living room. I'm going to start my video, everybody. Come here. Come over to me. So, everybody, this is my daughter, Abby. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, Abby. Hi, hi, Abby. Abby is five now, but... We, yeah, you are five. That's right. And the glasses are about a quarter of an inch thick. Um, you're in your pink glasses. Yes, you are. Abby was born on June 30th, 2015. Mom suffered from diabetes before pregnancy. Her first child is now 18 and he's in his room doing I don't know what. And he was born at nine pounds, 15 ounces, full term. This one was born seven pounds, four ounces at 32 or 37 weeks and had a 35 day NICU stay. Hold on. There we go. Hi, Abs. There you go. Now you're a little better. She suffers from bilateral microphthalmia. Her eyes are 25% the size of normal. Thank you, friends. Mm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and she is, um, she also had an intestinal malrotation. All of these things are 
contributed to by her mom's diabetes. Now my wife is pregnant again, and this time we recognized the pregnancy early, and we have been, had some great prenatal care, but my wife at the current time pushes 178 units of insulin a day. It's a lot, and this is with good, good care uh, from a high-risk specialist. So this is a serious thing, and if I knew before what I knew now, we'd have a lot of other things going on. Molly, would you like to say hi? Hi. <laughs> She's behind the computer again. Um, she is now 29 weeks pregnant with uh, baby Griffin, and they, we've already noted that there are going to be some complications and its yeah, so, potentials, yeah. and it's possibly diabetes. The one that's the kicker right now, instead of a three-vessel umbilical cord, we've already found out there is a two-vessel umbilical cord. You want to go play? No. Uh, no? <laughs> no, you want to sit here and say hi to people? <laughs> And also a jaw malformation potential. So this is a real serious thing. And so basically the month of October, I'm taking an entire month off class because we don't know what's going to happen. Absolutely. But um, for everybody who I am happy to answer questions about gestational diabetes, and so is my wife who is going <clears> through it. Um, it's definitely something that we're concerned about. And our uh, high-risk OB center is two hours away and love it. So mm. it's, uh, it's definitely going to be a, a challenge to if we have any emergency type complications. Can you say bye to everybody, Abby? Bye, everybody. <laughs> All right. Go hey, Abby. Abby. Bye, Abby. 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 Just real quick. Dr. Phillips, to to hey, thank yeah. you for showing us. Thank you for putting a face to this for us, okay? Can you say you're, you're a sweet girl. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Say bye. So there you go, guys. That's that's my contribution to this tonight. Oh, I I you you don't understand how much I appreciate that because, like I said, this does put a face on this, and we need that. We need to understand how what we do affects people. So thank you. I will say that at five. She's a pistol. We wish she would learn how to sleep. She sleeps about four to six hours a night, and that's it. And so it's definitely troublesome. But she's sitting over on the floor playing. Her vision is probably somewhere in the range of 21,000 visual acuity. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a deficit, but she makes the best of it. And, and she uses her cane. She walks around. She's very personable, as you can tell. She, it, it definitely... It worked out like it was supposed to work out, but it was definitely a complication, including a 35-day NICU stay. Yeah. Once again, I, I do thank you for that. Well, if nobody else has any other questions or comments, I won't open up rude gestures so you don't have to open your cameras. Um, but, and once again, if you have any questions, send them to me, more than happy to answer questions. Then I think we'll let everyone get to sleep. I appreciate you staying up. I know that we went over time on this, um, but obviously this is something that I think that we have an opportunity to actually head off disease and complications. I think this was excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. Thank you for everybody. This was a great lecture, a great time tonight. And uh, you guys have a great weekend coming up. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Uh, Good night. Good night.